So tonight we have a, an awesome speaker, a great topic. Uh, I know that before I, I just finished Dr. Wright's book, but before I had read it, I didn't know much about Dorothy Day. <clears throat> Dr. Wright and his lovely wife, Susan, were two of my professors during seminary. So when you don't, when my homilies go too long, you don't like them, you can talk to Dr. Wright after his talk, blame him. Um, Dr. Wright wrote his uh, doctoral dissertation on a guy named Edmund Husserl, uh, who is a very important philosopher who started a school of thought called phenomenology. Uh, it's hugely influenced major thinkers. He mentored Edith Stein, also known as St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross. He was a large influence on St. John Paul II, but Husserl was not himself Catholic. Uh, but Dr. Wright wrote on that for his dissertation. And, but what I want to tell you about Dr. Wright is that when I went to seminary, I wasn't really interested in philosophy. And I didn't think it was that important. And two years later, after I had finished my philosophy uh, cycle in the seminary, I remember thinking that for the first time in my life, I knew how to think. And I really mean that. I, the philosophy program at our seminary is phenomenal. Uh, Dr. Wright and his wife Susan are two of the best professors I've ever had in my life. And one of the great gifts that Dr. Wright has is that when you're in academia, there's a lot of people who can think very um, specifically and particularly, and they nail all the details. They know every detail and ins and outs of different thinkers. And then you have other professors who they're synthetic. They see the big picture. But there's very few who can move between the two. And Dr. Wright has always been able to do that. And I remember I had three courses from him in philosophy. And I was amazed at his ability to move back and forth. Uh, but finally, I, my, my last kind of line about Dr. Wright over the years I've known him is that truth is not an academic exercise for him, but he is a man who lives it. Uh, my community of the Companions of Christ has been deeply inspired by him, uh, him and his family. Uh, he's a man who loves the truth, who lives it well. He's given his life for the church, uh, and I'm just so thrilled that he agreed to speak tonight. So join me in welcoming uh, one of my favorite people on earth, Dr. Terry Wright. Father Brian, thank you uh, so much. Wow, that was quite an introduction. I'll have to live up to that. Um, I remember uh, last year, uh, Father John Neppel gave one of these talks, and he began by saying that uh, Father Brian had asked him to talk for about a half an hour, and Father John said, so about half as long as one of your homilies, right, Father? But I just want to go on record, Father, saying I, I love the length of your homilies, and uh, I always wake up so refreshed. So. <laughs> I know that some of you probably know a lot about Dorothy Day, and um, I'm going to be saying some things that you already know. Um, there may be others who have heard the name and don't know that much, and I think I'm going to at least the first part of my talk hopes to serve as an introduction. And, um, and then I'll just also talk a little bit about the Catholic Worker Movement, which uh, she founded along with Peter Marin. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dorothy Day was born in 1897. She died in 1980. Um, she was not raised uh, in a religious household. Um, she had very little understanding of it, uh, but she always felt sort of drawn towards it, and um, it was something that sh she always felt attracted to, but never could, uh, never really engaged. Um, as she got older, she, uh, she became interested when she was at the university. She went to the University of Illinois at Urbana, and uh, while she was there, she started studying um, Marx and communism and got interested in those ideas along with some of her friends and decided at that point she said she was going to rip religion very deliberately out of her life. Um, she uh, left the university without graduating, went to New York, made a, started to make a living as a journalist, and um, it was during that time that she met and fell in love with a man named um, Lionel Mosey. He was about eight or nine years older than her. She was about 20. And he was, uh, he was also a journalist. And so she, uh, she moved in with him. And about a year later, she found out she was pregnant. Um, Lionel made it very clear to her that he was not interested in getting married, that he was not interested in having a family. And when he found out that she was pregnant, he insisted that she have an abortion. 
So he, he arranged for her to have the abortion. She had the abortion. And he immediately abandoned her. In, same day, okay, practically. And um, she was devastated by that, both by the, the abortion and by the abandonment. And so she, uh, she attempted suicide a couple of times. Um, she was in despair. She was, didn't know what to do. On the rebound, she ends up marrying uh, a man who was about 16, 17 years older than her, a man who had been married several times. Um, that marriage lasts less than a year. So by the time she's 24, um, she's had an abortion, she's had a failed marriage, she's had some suicide attempts. She is really in a, in, in a very dark and, and sad place. Right? And um, she continues to try to work as a journalist. And she, after living in Chicago for a while and New Orleans for a while, she moves back to New York City. And she meets and falls in love with um, a man called Foster Batterham. Now, Foster is uh, very much in love with her. Um, they decide to live together. Um, and, but he is an anarchist. He's not, again, not interested in marriage, not interested in family. And about a year in, into this relationship, she discovers that she's pregnant again. Um, but she, was, she takes this pregnancy as a sign of God's forgiveness. Right? She experiences this as a profound act of God's mercy because she was really afraid that she was never going to be able to have children, that the abortion had left her, her unable to have children. Right? So she tries to convince Foster to marry her and, and raise the child together, um, but he refuses. Right? That would be against his principles. So she um, has the child. She's also convinced that she's going to have her child baptized Catholic, that she says she doesn't want her child having with, trying to go through life without a moral foundation like she has. So she has her child, uh, her daughter Tamar, baptized, and pretty clearly recognizes that she herself cannot raise her child Catholic if she isn't Catholic. Right? So she decides to also enter the church. And realizing that that means she is going to have to end this relationship with this man who she deeply loves, right? But she realizes she can't say that she's a Catholic and reject the teachings of the Catholic Church. Right? So she ends that relationship and begins her life as a single mother, taking care of Tamar. She uh, works sort of as a freelance writer for a while. Uh, she does some other jobs. She ends up taking a job as a screenwriter in Hollywood for a while. And she goes, moves out to Hollywood and does some screenwriting. Um, the Great Depression sets in. She loses that job. The, the, the studio goes under. And so she returns to New York. And um, again, just sort of trying to make ends meet by journalism and, and other odd jobs. And in, uh, in 1932, right, in the, uh, so the Depression is pretty well underway, she gets an assignment from America Magazine to travel to uh, Washington, D.C. to report on um, a hunger march that the communists had put together to uh, a hunger march of, of men who were unemployed, of people whose homes and farms had been foreclosed, and to, uh, who were there protesting the government policies. And she's sent by America to go down and cover that. And she had always been attracted to social justice and questions of, of social concern. The, the newspapers that she generally wrote for were, were uh, socialist and communist newspapers. And, um, but she felt, since she had become Catholic, she couldn't really engage in, in that because communism is, um, by, by definition, atheistic. And so she, uh, she but she's t incredibly drawn to these men and women who are marching in this march. So on, uh, this is on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December in 1932. So on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., she goes to the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception on the, on the campus of Catholic University, and she prays to the Blessed Mother to give her some way to join together her Catholicism and her concerns for social justice. The next day, sitting in her kitchen when she gets back to New York is Peter Marin, the man that she is going to found the Catholic Worker Movement with. Right? With Peter Marin, she decides that she is going to commit her life to the works of mercy. Right? That she had had that profound experience of God's mercy in her life, and she decides to commit her life to that. 
right? So the rest of her life becomes the, um, the working out of the Catholic worker movement. Now, Peter Marin had a vision for that with really three parts. One was houses of hospitality. Right? He, he hoped that they would be in every parish, right? A house that would see to the material needs of the poor and the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the less fortunate, a place that would house them and feed them, okay? The second aspect of Peter Marin's program was to get the teachings of the Catholic Church on these issues out to the public. Right? And towards that end, he wanted to found a newspaper. Okay? Now that's clearly what attracted Dorothy Day. She was a journalist. She, she wanted that opportunity to, to write that paper and, and edit that paper. The third thing he wanted were um, what become Catholic worker farms, right? Where people can work together uh, when they can serve the common good and raise food to help feed the hungry and, 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 and the, and the, um, the, uh, the breadlines. Right? So it's that program that the, three, that the two of them put into, begin to put into place. So by, uh, the, by May 1st, 1933, they published the first, uh, first edition of the Catholic Worker newspaper. Now, what really shapes, I want to kind of talk about this in light of um, two, two scriptural passages that were very important to Dorothy Day. Right? Um, the first is Matthew 25. Um, I, I'm, I'm nervous about talking about scripture with Father Brian around because I, I don't know how to read it in Greek and I can't do any of those things, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Father. But, uh, but what we find there is that when the, uh, the Son of Man comes into his kingdom, and that you remember this passage is where he is deciding who is going to be uh, saved. And um, he says, you know, that for those who had, are entering in on his right hand, he says, For when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Now, for Dorothy Day, that, he's, Christ there doesn't say, the poor person is a symbol of me, right? Or the poor person is a metaphor for me. Or the stranger kind of represents me, right? That, that, that these people, in fact, are Jesus Christ. We are all joined together in the body of Christ, right? We are all members or potential members of the mystical body. That, for Dorothy Day, is central. Right? So that when she understood what she was doing, she wasn't just serving the other, she was serving Jesus Christ. She was serving Christ in that ministry. Right? So when she was proclaimed by the church, um, when her cause for her canonization was accepted um, in 2000, when she was proclaimed a servant of God, that was a very accurate and profound way that she thought of herself, right? that she saw herself as that type of servant. Right? So the responsibility that she saw towards the poor was not just trying to be a do-gooder, but really saw the necessity of recognizing Christ in these people and serving them as best she could. Right? Now, the, uh, this takes the form, in a lot of ways, in, by performing what are called the works of mercy. Right? Hopefully, you remember that the church recognizes um, seven corporal and seven spiritual works of mercy, right? And let me, uh, I have to check my notes because I don't remember them either. Okay, the corporal ones, right, to serve the person's body, right? You've got to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned, bury the dead, right? And those are very much, uh, much of that activity was done at the houses of hospitality, right? They were geared towards that sort of, um, those corporal works of mercy, right? Serving these material needs. But equally important for day are the spiritual works of mercy, right? Instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, admonish the sinner, comfort the sorrowful, bear wrongs patiently, forgive all injuries, pray for the living and the dead. And, and part of what she saw that was going on, she was trying to accomplish with the newspaper was just that, right? To instruct the in innocent, or the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to admonish the sinner, right? And if you read the Catholic Worker, there's a lot of that in there. She's not afraid of admonishing sinners when she sees them, right? Um, but she recognized that 
to really serve the human person, we have to be engaged in both of those activities, both the corporal and the spiritual. Right? And sometimes we, it's kind of easy, and I think Dave was concerned, that a lot of times we think we don't really have those responsibilities because somebody else does, right? And particularly with regard to the corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, we oftentimes think, well, you know, that's what the state does, okay? They have programs and they take, they take care of people, right? And in, tr in, in some sense, that's, that's true, right? But the state can't really serve the person because the state can only serve those corporal acts, right? They cannot and should not be engaged in the spiritual acts of mercy, right? I don't want the state to be doing that, right? I don't want Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton as my spiritual advisor, okay? That's not what I want, right? Those, but, those, but, the, but human beings have that spiritual need as much as they have that corporal need, right? And so the importance of us making those efforts, not just to be sure that they are fed and clothed, but to instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, admonish the sinner, comfort the sorrowful, right? That those are as important acts, right? And so the, the structure of the Catholic worker houses and the houses of hospitality were to do both of those, to create an environment where the persons that they were serving were experiencing the full richness of that personhood. Right? And so she, she makes that, um, that becomes central to her, to her mission. Okay. <laughs> the second scriptural passage that is also so important to her right, is the, uh, the story of the, the loaves and the fishes. Okay. And she particularly was drawn to the version that we find in the Gospel of John. Right? Because it's there that we are told who provides the loaves and the fishes. If you remember, and again, I worry about quoting scripture with Father over there, but um, Simon Peter said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Right? So we are identified that this boy provides the, the loaves and the fishes. And what Day understood in that and loved about that was this kid had nothing, right? He's got very little, right? But what we know is he gives it all to Christ, right? He doesn't save some for himself, right? He doesn't decide he's going to sell it to the people and all those hungry people in the crowd, right? He gives it all to Christ. Right? And that for Day is who we are. Right? We don't have much, right? but if we give it all to Christ, Christ can do miraculous things. Right? And it's that image that inf it kind of also drives her thinking, particularly understood in terms of St. Teresa of Lisieux's little way. Right? Um, when they said when she was a young woman, she was interested in saints like, like Joan of Arc, big saints. Right? But as she got older, she realized that it's really the little way of St. Teresa that's, that really speaks to how most of us have to live our lives. She calls St. Teresa the saint of the responsible. Right? That in order that, you know, we can't do much, but we have to do the little things. Right? Um, you know, she was, she was concerned with people when they came to the Catholic worker and wanted to change the world, but didn't want to chop the vegetables for the soup line. Right? Um, you got to chop the vegetables. Right? Now, those of you out there who are parents know that you spend an inordinate amount of your time doing things like chopping the vegetables. Right? That's being responsible. That's what you have to do. Right? But it's not, it's not changing the world. But like the boy with the loaves and the fishes, if we give all that we have to Christ, Dorothy Day was convinced that, in fact, he can work great things. And so it became that image of the little way that really becomes her understanding of how we need to witness to Christ in our lives. Um, where are we at? All right. Last thing I want to talk about then is just a little bit, because people ask me about her canonization. And um, she was um, in, on the anniversary of, her, uh, anniversary of her death in 1997. Uh, Cardinal O'Connor of New York 
um, proposed her putting her forward for canonization. That was, um, the Vatican accepted that in 2000, and that's when she was given the title Servant of God. Um, in 2005, they opened up the Guild for Dorothy Day. They have a wonderful website. Um, if you want some information on Dorothy Day's canonization, the Guild for Dorothy Day uh, site. They also have a wonderful prayer there for her canonization, if you want to start saying that prayer. Um, so that's a good source. Um, in, 2000 and, uh, in 2013, Cardinal Dolan asked the U.S. Catholic bishops to support her cause, and they um, overwhelmingly did. And so right now, they're still moving, trying to move forward. Um, they are collecting testimony from those who know her, knew her, and can testify to her, to her life. Um, obviously, they are hoping for uh, a miracle, you know, miracles or something to be attributed to her. But it is, you know, canonizations are a slow process, but um, I'm, I'm hopeful and, and uh, prayerful that the, that will be realized. All right. I'm going to stop there, and Father said we're going to take a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, so, Doc, I'm wondering if you could talk. <clears throat> there's, a there's a line of thought out there that says, and you talk about this in your book, there's a line of thought out there that says Dorothy Day was a dissenting Catholic. She didn't love the teachings of the Catholic Church. She was Catholic, but she wanted to fight a lot of the dogmas the Church teaches. And I know, I know what you write about in that, but could you just speak to that a bit? Uh, yeah, in fact, that was part of, the part of my motivation for writing the book was I think that there is sometimes a misperception of her that she was a dissenting Catholic. But if you look at her writings, and, and in my book I really try to, to document her writings, I try to have her speaking for herself as much as possible, what you see is someone who loved the Catholic Church, who loved the teachings of the Catholic Church. Right? She does not dissent from them. Uh, her, the, the teachings on abortion, on uh, artificial birth control, on the sanctity of marriage, on uh, sex outside of marriage. I mean, those, those teachings are, are all part of her understanding. Now, she also clearly embraces um, this, the, what are sometimes considered the, the social teachings, the importance of the common good, the, uh, the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity, and, uh, and those are all part of it too. But um, there is never a point in which she criticizes the teachings of the church. She would, on occasion, criticize church leaders if she did not think they were living up to those teachings. But she does not criticize those teachings, with possible exception of just war theory and her position on pacifism. And if somebody really wants me to talk about that, I will. But I'm going to leave it there for now. <laughs> OK. All right. Your wish is my command. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. I was just getting the feeling that you uh, seem to have neutered Dorothy Day's radicalism. She made some jokes about not being made into some sort of plaster saint. Um, she was a pacifist. Uh, she was anti-war even after Pearl Harbor, after uh, the uh, predominantly Catholic anti-war opposition mm -hmm. had been destroyed mm -hmm. by various political means and also by the course of history. Uh, she opposed Social Security, uh, not because she was a libertarian, but because she thought it got in the way of a just distribution of property. Mm -hmm. She criticized it because it meant security for industrialists rather than confiscation. Um, that is a very radical position from our age. I mean, maybe modern day industrialists do deserve to have their property confiscated given all the, uh, the naughtiness they get up to and all the people they have killed. Um, just how do you make sense of that radicalism? I, I, don't, I don't mean to turn her into a plastic saint, and, and I know that she sometimes, I mean, she's a famous line where she says, don't, make, don't call me a saint, I don't want to dis be dismissed that easily, right? But if you look at it in its context, what she's saying is, a lot of times we do want to dismiss saints by saying, oh, that person's a saint, I could never be like that, right? And so we don't want to recognize our own, the, 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 you know, we like let ourselves off the hook by saying other people do that because they're saints. Her radicalness is very much, um, um, a, a part of who she is. I think her pacifism is, if I have one place where I think that she dissents, it is in her pacifism. She cl clearly comes by the end of her life to reject what the church is teaching on war, which is just war theory. Right? She, um, she basically um, says, you know, she, she recognizes the, the principle of, um, you know, the, the need to protect the innocent, 
but she will not use anything but the weapons of the spirit, right? Prayer, fasting, uh, penance, okay? So she is, um, she is ex ex you know, that's a radical position, right? It was not a popular position. When she did not, uh, when she did not support uh, the entry of the war into World War II, the, uh, the circulation of the Catholic worker dropped from about 160,000 down to 50,000. Right? Many, many Catholic worker houses closed in, during the Second World War, partly because the men who ran them were drafted, partly because Dorothy Day would not allow them to operate if they were not pacifists. Right? So that pacifism, and you find that she was arrested several times in the 50s for opposing uh, um, air raid drills, uh, she was, um, she was uh, an outspoken critic of um, the Vietnam War, so I, I think that's all out there, yeah. Wasn't the part I was going to talk about, but I get, thanks for giving me the chance to do it. Is that... I was wondering when she did come back to a faith life, what drew her to Catholicism or why did she convert to Catholicism and not Catholicism? Um, you know, she just, I don't know if there was a... Um, a, a reason you could put your finger on. There was something about the, the Catholic, uh, I mean, part of it, she was drawn to the beauty of the, of the liturgies. And I think that was maybe the, what drew her in initially. I, and there, she tells stories of, uh, you know, on her way home uh, from closing the bars in Greenwich Village with uh, um, Eugene O'Neill, that she would stop in morning mass before she was Catholic, before she knew much about it, just she felt drawn there. Talks about going to benedictions. She, she loved the beauty of the Catholic um, liturgies, and I think that was an initial draw. But I, she also just began to see in her own life, I think, the truth of the teachings of the Catholic Church, um, that this really was um, where she was going to end up. But I don't know if there's a really conscious decision about, well, why Catholicism and not something else? I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for that. That's a good question. Hi, Dr. Ray. Um, so I wanted to ask you about one thing that really struck me in your talk was um, you mentioned that they grew up not only without religion, but um, you know, not really without like a moral foundation. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that really spoke to me as somebody who didn't grow up Catholic myself, um, and somebody who was also raised you know, very liberal, like very left-wing. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the reasons I've always been drawn today um, to day. Right. Um, <laughs> today. <laughs> um, aside, um, aside from Thomas Merton, she's sort of the only like modern religious figure or saint that I can find that didn't grow up without that moral foundation. So I was wondering if there's anything um, in your book or others or in her writings of her own that really kind of speaks to that, that speaks to like the obstacles she had of not being raised with that foundation? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I mean, her, her parents were perfectly moral people, I think, um, but they were not religious. Her, her father was a journalist. He was a sports writer. He covered horse racing was his... Uh, his specialty, um, and he, you know, and that's the, they were very happy, you know, very, for, for the most part, a happy family, I guess. She had four brothers and sisters. Um, she, um, the, the two books that you might want to read if you're interested in reading on Dorothy Day. Um, the, the kind of classic work is The Long Loneliness. That's really her account of her life, and it's, it, she published that in 1952, and it's, it's a wonderful work. But there's a shorter, her first attempt at an autobiography is a book I like a real lot. It's a shorter work. It's a little bit um, uh, direct, more direct in some ways, called From Union Square to Rome. And if you're looking for something that you may be like, what can I read by Dorothy Day? Um, you know, that may be a good, a good book to start with, where she kind of talks about, um, you know, wishing that she had that moral foundation, realizing that a lot of the dark periods of her life happened because she didn't have that foundation. And I think she, she tells that story, obviously, very well in those, in those books. So maybe that's where I'd send you. Sometimes we try to identify saints with particular activities or a particular a pattern of love or pattern of uh, jobs or whatever. I don't try to simplify her because it seems that her life was very rich in bad and negative experiences, but would you be able to focus her life in a particular kind of a pattern if she becomes the same? Um, I guess you know, I've already spoken to it. I really think that more than that the, the, the emphasis on the works of mercy are really just kind of the defining aspect of things for, for her. Um, and so I, I think if I were to look at anything and say, you know, that's, if you want to look at a saint who really tried to put the works of mercy into, into action, 
um, very deliberately, that's where I think I would look for in Dorothy Day. But that, mm, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. But take. Two questions, actually. One, um, you mentioned Peter Marin. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why she is up for canonization as, and as a servant of God and he is not? Um, so that's my first question, if you can answer that. Um, you know, I would be real happy to see Peter Marin be uh, considered for canonization. I think there is a somewhat of a movement to, to want to do that. I mean, part of the trick with Peter Marin is he, we don't know that much about him. He, he just is this kind of shadowy in that sense. You know, we don't know much about his, his life. Um, you know, Dorothy Day tried to write a book on his life, and it, and it, it was published. Um, it's co-authored. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the book, but I'm, I'm skipping the name. Um, but he was, you know, he was fascinating. I mean, I, I, I you know, I think about Peter Martin a lot. Um, he wrote, um, along with sort of having this vision, and, and I mean, he was such an interesting guy. He was, um, uh, one, of the, uh, the, um, one of the bishops of New York said he was the most well-read man he ever met. But he was, in a sense, a fool for Christ. He was just as happy to be sleeping on a park bench in his clothes as to be doing, you know, anything else. And he was, um, he really had this desire to get the, the, what he called the dynamite of the church, the church's teachings on these social issues out there. Um, and he wrote a lot of these really short essays. All he ever really wrote are these very short essays that you can read very quickly, which uh, Dorothy Day's brother gave the title to Easy Essays, which Peter Martin didn't really love that title, but that is how they have become known. And they, they are published, and they're fascinating. And what you get is an idea of a man who did think deeply and try to express those deep thoughts very simply. So um, I think that, you know, I mean, part of it is Dorothy Day was a much more of a public figure. She wrote a lot more, so there's a lot more about Dorothy Day that we know. But if somebody called me tomorrow and said, you know, we're going forward with Peter Martin, I would be delighted with that. Second question, um, you mentioned kind of her three points that she was focused on. Um, as, uh, as a pastor of a parish, um, would you give the same advice to pastors to open up these houses of hospitality? And then what advice, what advice would you give to priests and communities? And what advice would you give to kind of uh, lay people, married people, as Dorothy Day would say? Oh, boy. Um, as Dorothy Day would say, good, because that would be different than what I think. <laughs> no, I just don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if it would be different. I don't know if I thought. Um, I mean, like I said, Peter Martin really saw the houses of hospitality, what should be something that every parish has and that every parish is responsible for. Um, and I think any ways in which the parishes can, can take that up is, is really good. I mean, obviously, Dorothy Day thought that um, she loved the priest, priesthood, she, she loved the clergy. She also recognized that they, they should understand that they are called to a life of simplicity. Um, one of the things that she, that she was critical of is when she saw priests who she thought were more concerned with their own comfort than with the, the needs of the poor. Um, and so I think she was, would have called the, uh, the clergy to simplicity. Um, she also recognized that not everybody is called to work at a Catholic worker. Right? That's not, I mean, I haven't worked at a Catholic worker. Right? Um, that, I, that's, I never felt that was what I was called to. Um, we are all called to witness to Christ in our lives. We are all called to um, try to perform the acts of mercy, uh, the works of mercy in, in whatever ways possible for us. Right? We are called to, um, to do those you know, little things with great love. And, um, and I think that we, you know, and maybe, you know, we, I mean, uh, thinking about Dorothy Day, reading Dorothy Day may help us all think about that and, and figure out how we can do that in our lives. Does that sort of help? Tom? Thank you very much for being here. Um, can you give a little bit more uh, about the history and the specifics of the Catholic worker movement for those that may not uh, have as deep of a knowledge base? Sure. Um, she, she and Peter Martin, wanting to put Peter Martin sort of three point program into place, uh, begin with the newspaper, um, but it became very obvious that they also needed to open up a houses of hospitality themselves, which they did in New York City, um, a couple of them. And they also tried to establish the, uh, the farming communities uh, with varying degrees of success uh, and, uh, over, uh, over the years. 
Um, but she did inspire a lot of other people to open up Catholic worker houses. Now, what the model of the Catholic worker house is that the volunteers and the guests um, live together in the same house all the time. They share everything together. They live off of donations. They have embraced voluntary poverty. Um, and so the, the idea being that, you know, it's, this isn't charity. This is living together like a family. This is a community of love. And so they're, they're done on a very small scale, right? And it's, it's about those small acts, and right? And you're, you're so, you know, this house of hospitality can only hold eight people. Okay, but those eight lives are better, okay? So uh, that model, and again, it was always sort of a loose affiliation. I mean, Dorothy Day was basically a, an anarchist. She did not want some sort of centralized authority over the Catholic worker. She was promoted it, she visited those houses, she was, you know, interested in them, but she also recognized that they are loosely affiliated. There's still about 240 Catholic worker houses around the world. Um, just to kind of finish my thought, there are also um, a, a number of Catholic worker farms um, around the world, and, and, uh, and people who are interested in that, um, there's, they have different um, different charisms and and, uh, and so again but again they're they are loosely affiliated there's there isn't this sort of a central location but they have a sort of shared commitment to um, the, the works of mercy I think if there's one thing that that binds them all together is that uh, commitment to the works of mercy right? and a commitment to the model of um, not a large institution but a, a small community that's trying to serve the people as best they can okay, okay thank you Let's give a, a big thank you to Dr. Rain.